Max Golden wins the game for the Melbourne Demons to put them in the minor premiership position for the first time since 1964. The dogs stink their way out of the top four on percentage. And the season is over for both of our shit scene sides. Nice, finally. Yeah! This, this is the Drill Footy, Footy Show. Hello, you confidence, and welcome back to this week's episode of the Drill Footy Show. We're back, baby. Regular season, done. Okay. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in so far. And if you want to keep contributing to the show, go follow DrewFooty underscore on Instagram. We're closing in on 5.5k subs, and that number means absolutely nothing except a goal in my head. I wanted to hit 5.5k by the end of the month, and we're almost there, buddy. Make sure you subscribe if you are enjoying the content. Plenty of finals content coming out very soon. If you get us there, we will go to Metro's. Go! <laughs> <laughs> Bloke of the week, Jesse. It could have been a plethora because I always like to give it to a legend of the game or just some fat bloke playing local footy mm. doing something stupid. You have to be one or the other. Exactly. <laughs> There's no in between. And this week, I've gone with the most legendary retiree, I believe. I'm giving, I am giving Bloke of the Week to Eddie Betts this week. He played 350 games at the AFL level for 640 goals. And he's one of those players that you'll never forget in your whole lifetime because the moments that he created, I think he had something like five goal of the years or something mm. like that. And genuine legend of the game. He's done so much for the in Indigenous Australia community as well, being a voice for that, voice for change. They don't come much better than Eddie Betts as a bloke. So, uh, yeah, what's your favourite Eddie Betts moment? I don't know about moments, but I, th I think back... When I think of Eddie Betts, I think of that incredible 75-goal season uh, back in 2017, probably, when they made the yeah, grand okay. final. Um, and that's a rare feat. Like, the common medalist kicked 58 goals this year. Yeah, so 75 yeah. for a small forward? Ridiculous. Mine would be the left foot banana against Gold Coast in the Eddie Betts pocket. Mm, there you go. So you're, you're at the bloke of the week, Eddie Betts. Good job. Great career, buddy. On to the winners and losers of the week, Jesse. And we're going to start off talking about the West Coast Eagles. They're not winners or losers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about the Brisbane Lions okay. who won this game. And after the last few weeks, were you pretty pleased with the, the fight that Eagles put up for three and a half quarters? Because they were in the game in that last quarter. Up for the contest. They uh, moved the ball with a lot less fear. That There's one play that stuck out to me in particular when Shuey copped a handball and then... Big torpedo oh, yeah. down to Darling. Like, that's exactly what you've been missing, just someone that's going to take the game on. What did you make of the West Coast performance? Yeah, no, I'm pretty happy with the effort, to be honest. We did the live streams. Quite a fun uh, afternoon with Callum there. And, um, yeah, at 38 points, the margin probably makes it seem like it was more one-sided than it was. I think we were five, five, four points down midway through the last quarter. Brisbane obviously had to get on their bike for percentage. But I think the, the contested stuff and the hardness of the contest, um, Nat Nui, Shui and Yo also playing their best games in long time. Yeah. Uh, it was really quite entertaining. We got a question here from Eagles underscore HQ and he says, will the Eagles bounce back next year? What what would you say the percentage chance is of them bouncing into the top eight next season? 50. 50? 50 percent, <laughs> yeah. The reason... Can't fit it. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about this. I equally think it's possible we could go into the bottom four or the top four next year. We're yeah. in a weird sort of balance right there. I think I made this point to you the other day. I think our issues aren't age. So people look at us having an aging list and a lot of our stars are old and that is an issue, but it's not the reason we're playing shit right now. Our mm. issues are more ball movement, um, how engaged and I think fitness as well. Yeah. Um, so if we correct those, then I think the Eagles do snap back into the top eight, but there's no guarantee that'll happen. Snap back to reality. Oh, there goes Western Bulldogs outside of the top four because Brisbane steamed home in this game and that's why they're getting the winners of the week this week. In that fourth quarter, they really had to start getting on their bike. They were in the top four for most of this game. And then when the Eagles come back, it was like, oh, God, they're out of the floor again. In that fourth quarter, they uh, they just really turned it on. And they're really playing well as a unit. Jared Lyons had 14 tackles. Neil Zorko McCluggage all had goals from midfield as well. I think Jared Berry hasn't had a massive season. He had quite a big impact last year, but he had his most goals for the season with three. So he's another contributor coming into this side. They've got the Ds in the first week of the finals, and that is going to be a cracking game. I think Tom Cole did Jared Berry a bit of a favour there, giving him that second shot on yeah. goal. That's a moment I'll never forget. I was you were going off at Tom like, Cole. Like. Yeah, him and Dom Sheed, when Dom Sheed ran 25 metres the wrong way and got caught holding the ball and then didn't try and break the tackle. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, it was good. Lions are a big chance to win the flag this year, Jesse. Would you agree? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, they're um, they're now a finals hard inside. They've obviously played uh, home finals the last couple of years. This will be an interesting test for them this year. We're having to play an away final for the first time. But uh, yeah, I like what I'm seeing. I think there is a good chance to win as pretty much anyone. I agree, and they've come into a form at a very good time as well. Keep your eyes on the lines and the other winners of the week. How can you not give it to the side that won? the minor premiership, the Melbourne D-Dots down at GMHBA. They haven't won this fixture 
have they won this picture? <laughs> have they won down at GMHBA in like a million years? Well, I remember they got close in 18 when Tui broke yeah. the last half of the siren, um, which is what makes this game beautiful. But mm-hmm. I don't recall it happening. I don't think it's happened in my time watching football. So mm-hmm. yeah, we'd have to be going back decades. I was watching football all day on Saturday. I was feeling sorry for myself on the couch. I hurt my wrist last week and... Um, well, the the cause of that we will leave untold. But, <laughs> but I literally watched Richmond Hawthorne and then I watched Eagles Brisbane and then I was just watching footy all day. And by half time when Melbourne were getting pumped, I was like, I've had enough of football. I'm turning this off. I'm gonna go play some chess. Don't worry, I won the game of chess. I had a massive W against Sean. Playing right handed. Yeah, he's right. got a repetitive stress injury. But I took a massive L, Jesse, by missing the second half of this game because. Melbourne stormed back after Geelong kicking eight goals in that second quarter. They were really ticking. That's what Geelong can really do. It doesn't matter if they're in form or not. Once they get momentum swinging their way, they are dangerous. Cameron was popping up for goals. Hawkins was having fun. Dangerfield was having goals out of the middle. They were just getting all goals from all different avenues. And I thought, yep, this is it. Turn off the television. Third quarter, the spirit of the demons really lifted and... Uh, it was led by Clayton Oliver, who you could see from the first quarter was absolutely everywhere. I would be so intrigued to see how far that bloke runs in a game because he's at every contest, digging the ball out of the bottom of contests and just gaining so much ground. He had two really important goals in this game as well. Probably the best player in the competition at the moment, arguably. And uh, Cozzy Pickett had a massive game. I think he had three goals as well. Charlie Spargo popped up with a few. That last sort of 45 seconds was... Ridiculous mm. the way that went down. I think it was uh, Brayshaw who kicked it out, got given paid deliberate, quite controversial. Gets kicked down the line, out of bounds on the fall, and Close just punches it into Cater McDonald's backyard. And that have... was a double massive mistake from Geelong. No yeah. one's really talking about the fact that Guthrie had the chance to, you know, sew up the game. He kicks it out on the fall, and then Close belts it. <laughs> like, oh, it was just meant to be, mate. It was yeah, meant to be. Lever, Lever goes up to the 50 meter mark, just about. Could have had a shot himself. I bet. Matt Melbourne fans are probably saying, have a shot, have a shot. But no one marked Max Gorn. Pretty much had a free run at the ball and takes a mark. Two years after missing right in front of goal against Geelong to win the game in 2018. Tui won after the siren down at GMHBA a couple years ago as well. All the years I've heard and 180-something point loss down there. Max Gorn, the skipper of the football club, puts the boys on his back after the siren to win the minor premiership for the first time since 1964. And he delivers, baby! Flag D's is on! Yes! That is stiffening. Flag these nuts. That is literally the best moment of the season, though. Mm. Absolutely crazy. I wish there was a crowd there, but maybe if there was a crowd there, it wouldn't have happened. So, you know, yeah, silver true. lining. This has been a season written, and the script has been written by Caden McDonald. Yeah. Like, just to break Geelong Hearts at GMHBA. Unfortunately, he couldn't be there. That's the only other point. But for Max Gorn to do it specifically, yeah. it's huge. I do wonder what effect that will have going into the finals. Does it spur Geelong on? Do, does Melbourne sort of celebrate and get maybe a little ahead of themselves. That's entirely possible, so interesting times. Bit of a form slump for Geelong, who could probably have been the losers of the week. I won't give it to them, but they lost to GWS down there. Now they've lost to Melbourne down there. After not losing at GMHBA for such a long time, they're looking vulnerable, but it's a very poor time for the Bulldogs, who we'll get onto next, and Geelong to go into a form slump. Yeah, Geelong have played their last three home and away games at GMHBA, only won two of them, and the one that they won, they gave a five-goal lead and had to claw back and beat St Kilda by 12 points. True. So they're not playing very good footy at the moment. St Kilda are very good, though. Mm. On to the losers of the week. We are the losers of the week. You are so weak. Port Adelaide, clap your cheeks, you little bitches. So the losers of the week, I'm giving it to the Western Bulldogs. I think I've given it to them two weeks in a row, and they bloody deserve it for being on top of the ladder for just about the whole season, or thereabouts, top three just about all year. They topped the ladder a month ago, lost three in a row, and you can't do that when you're at the top of the ladder. It moved you out of the top four. You don't get a double chance, and you're probably going to have to play, well, you will have to play a top four side in an elimination final before even getting to a prelim. So the rocky road just gets rockier for the Bulldogs, who have won a premiership from outside of the uh, top four before. We all know that, and they've got the quality to go all the way, but a terrible time to have a form slump. I can empathise with the Bulldogs fans. This is where the Eagles have finished the last two years, and it's been a case of been in a good position to take the top four twice, um, the Eagles, and then blown it late, and now the Dogs have done exactly that, probably in slightly worse fashion, but like you said, what they got going for them, they've won outside the top four, they've got a premiership quality team, just mm-hmm. about, you would say, uh, and also, you know, with neutral 
finals venues, this is probably the best year to finish out Top 4. And Port Adelaide, who have been labelled as pretenders all year, I didn't give them much credit going into this game, just because they haven't beaten a Top 4 side. And 10 minutes before the bounce, I was watching the broadcast, and I was just like... Port will get up for this, I reckon. So I tipped them, changed my tip, and got it right. In that first quarter, I thought that was going to be a, a bad tip change. And uh, <laughs> it, it looked like the dogs were on and they were finding avenues to go. What let the dogs down, I think, though, I think they've chucked Tim English up forward and he's just not rucking hardly at all. And they had some bloke called Young, who I haven't seen before. And uh, I think even Mitch Hannon was in the ruck. And they're really missing a, ruck con a ruckman because the contest... When the ball was tapped down, they're, they're getting dominated. Scotty Lysett had a field day and gave first juice to the Power Boys, who ended up getting on top of the contest. And it wasn't a great performance by any means from the Power. I just thought the Bulldogs looked flat all day long, to be honest. Port had very, like lots of skill errors all game long. They only kicked one goal in the first half, which you haven't ever, really ever seen from Port Adelaide. So uh, it was a good win because obviously it secures a home preliminary, uh, a home final, potentially a home preliminary final if they win this week. But I wasn't too impressed by it, Port Adelaide, which speaks to how much the Bulldogs have fallen, if that makes any sense at all. Robbie Gray came in clutch with the match-winning goal. As he so often does. Yes. He's a very clutch player. Some would say he should be called. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. <laughs> Funny That's again. That's actually decent. They call me Emmanuel. Why? Because I'm so clutch. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> good. Port Adelaide are actually one of the most informed sides in the competition by results, though. They've won nine out of their last ten, only losing to Melbourne in that time. We do have a question here from Harry Crosby22, and he wants to know Are Port Adelaide not talked about enough for the flag? How big of a sniff are they? This, how, is, this is how big I think they are. Solid sniff. That's a good 7 out of yeah. 10, yeah. Yeah, they're in really good form. Uh, have they not been talked about enough? I don't know. I don't think up until the last few weeks they've really earned that. You know mm. what I mean? I think the, the criticisms against them were fair, but now they've deservedly sort of put themselves in the frame by beating the Bulldogs away. Biggest win of the season. And they may be one of the only team, teams in this final series who gets genuine home finals. Mm. And they've guaranteed two home finals now, regardless of whether they win the first or um, lose it. So, yeah, they're a genuine sniff, uh, but because of the fact that they're top two. But also, I think they're a little bit healthier now. Butters and Dersma in particular are two young guns that have come back into the side, give them a bit of energy. Mm -hmm. um, and they're a finals experience team, so you've got to give them a chance. I wonder when Orazio will be back. Because I think he did a hamstring, so it could be like a three-weeker. But Miss Georgiades did do a hamstring streaming mm -hmm. down the field, which sucks to see such a young gun player. Hopefully, it's just a three-weeker and he can... Uh, make an impact if he comes in late in the finals in a very high pressure game but I've lo loved watching him play this season so it was bad and sad to see him go down with an injury next game bad sad and unfortunately we also have to put the Fremantle Dockers in the losers of the yeah, week this week yeah, Jesse and I am very yeah. sad okay we can't back up a solid performance we haven't done that all season long we beat Richmond we show up the next week against Brisbane who are a great side in, to be fair to them but that just didn't show up around any of the contests just Got outworked in that game. Show up against West Coast. Good pressure pretty much all day. Held on well. Progressed the ball up the ground well when we needed to. Show up against St Kilda, who have pretty much a VFL side in at the moment with the amount of injuries they have. They didn't have Max King in. Uh, probably heaps more than I'm forgetting. I don't really watch or care about St Kilda. <laughs> so, obviously, we had a lot of injuries, but it wasn't an excuse. And I think we've seen Chara play for the last time against Frio in that derby because he was out late with a corky, and we really missed the skill and the finesse of Chara because it was just clunky shit football all day long. So many skill errors all day long. We were moving the ball up the ground, just the same long down the line style all game. When we did go into the corridor, skill errors led to turnovers and then our defense just lost its shape completely. It was like very bad. It was a very bad performance. And I can't believe, like, these are night and day bipolar performances. People in my stream were saying, oh, you're being harsh on Frio. You know, they've had a good season. I think overall, yes, it's been a good season. But you can't dish this shit up, bro. If you went to a restaurant and someone took a shit on your plate and said, here, eat this, you'd be like, no. But every second meal was a steak. Yes. I like those odds. <laughs> <laughs> the key thing for us that we are missing, Jesse, is just consistent pressure. We, we release the pressure. It's like we're taking blood pressure and we keep twisting the dial a bit too early and then you don't get an accurate reading. Yes. My sports science experience. <laughs> <laughs> Justin Longmuir said it perfectly in the press conference. We can't bring the pressure quarter to quarter, let alone contest to contest, and it's the same players bringing it every week. Sam Switkowski, one of our best pressure players, played in the midfield and had a great first half and then he went out with some really painful injury by the looks of it. We don't know what's happened to him yet, but... um. 
Very, very disappointing end to Frio's season. It just leaves a bad smell. I'll tell you what one positive was, though. Hayden Young is going to be an absolute stud in a few years. Hayden Young gun. But we wouldn't have made the eight anyway, and we lost, falling behind St. Kilda and West Coast. So we got a better draft pick. So, you know, we're going to need a nice new silky midfielder to cover up that Adam Chera role. Adam Chera, please don't leave. I'm begging you. If there is any chance you watch this video, please, everyone, send this to Adam Chera. Please stay. I'm begging you. I'll get a tattoo of you on my leg if you stay. Next. I hope you stay now, too. Back to our regular programming. Yes, Jesse, and we're going to be signing with Richmond and Hawthorne. It was just a game of celebration, this one at the MCG, in front like of absolutely chocolates. no one. Yes. So Asprey was having his last game, and he played very well. I think he had one of his most uh, possessions in a game ever in his career, so that was good. Uh, Hawley didn't play, but he retired after the game as well, and obviously Sean Burgoyne, a 400-game legend. Alistair Clarkson's last game at Hawthorne as well. Richmond looking like a, a shell of their former self in this game. Hawthorne pretty much dominated the game for most parts and I think they had it won with about five minutes left until Jack Rewald with 40 seconds left slots one from the boundary and you're thinking nah surely not Hawthorne have been in control of this game the whole time gets a clearance inside 50 Jack Rewald just gets a foot to it dribbles across the line I thought Sean Bergwijn would have got fingers to it just for the story but he didn't Jack Rewald said after the game I sort of wish he got fingers to that that would have been funny story of my love life the Hawks have had a good season do you think they can back it up next year without Clarkson? Yes, I do think they can. I think they've underachieved a little bit this year. I think their team, their, their quality stars are in their prime. They've still got a lot of them when you compare them to the other bottom four sides. O'Meara and Mitchell had a massive game against Richmond. Both yep. had 36 touches. I expect Hawthorne to be a smoky for the eight next year. I don't think that's necessarily on the back of all their youth. I think they still need to keep rebuilding through the draft. But um, yeah, I think they're going to be a tough team to beat at times. Richmond finally get a... Uh, post-season off for the first time since 2016, they're going to have a lot of rest. A lot of, a lot of sleep to catch up on. That actually might be quite a big factor. You know, mm. They've gone deep into finals the last four years and suddenly with an extra four weeks to rest, recuperate, get that pre-season and then maybe they come back next year a new team. I could see it happening. Don't run off the Tigers. And for like the millionth time in their club's existence, the Suns have finished in the bottom three, getting pumped on the last game of the season to their Sydney Swans, who are looking absolutely electric, kicking 21 goals in this game. But he had six and could potentially have a 1,000 in finals, depending on how deep they go. Here's a stat for you. In the like 11 stats. years that Gold Coast have been in the AFL, 10 of them, they finished in the bottom five. They're, they're improving. They're a young side. You can say that every year about Gold Coast. Yeah. I've been pretty hard on them all year, and they have had some good performances, but uh, yeah, young side, they'll improve. <laughs> I'll back them in, honestly. I, I, I'm not into this, um, they're going to be shit forever kind of thing. I think yeah. you've got to give due some time, personally, and I think, yeah, I, I would keep with it for now, because the, the group they have now is really talented. Especially Tuke Miller, who broke the AFL record for most games consecutive with 30-plus disposals. So I've been talking about him all season. He's in that list of players that I mention every week. And this is why, because he's a record breaker, baby. Callum Mills did his Achilles, and an Achilles injury isn't one that you can bounce back from. It's a springy tendon. Okay. Springs. Bounce. No. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, Josh Kennedy should be back. In How a... long will it take to heal? Ah! Cal Caneel, tendon, heal. Anatomy. Josh Kennedy should be in for finals eventually. Sydney vs GWS in a final for the third time. And uh, we're going to be doing a preview of that on Jesse's channel on Just the Tips. Go check it out. GWS vs Carlton. Uh, a game I watched with a very close eye because I thought if, if GWS lost and everyone, we could get into the eight. But obviously that wasn't going to happen. And Carlton started this game by leading. But you know Carlton... They're like a, a man taking a dog on a walk without a hand. They can't hold a lead. It looks like Teague's gone. I will post a photo here of him leaving the three-quarter time huddle, and it looks grim. Mm -hmm. And the, the definition of uh, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. They're getting rid of their coach for another one. You know, that's a misquote and also factually incorrect. I don't care. They're making the wrong decision, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> what do you make of it? Ross Lyon in, David Teague out. If, if that's what's going to happen. I don't... Uh, it just does my head in, man. Carlton, I think, their players just haven't bought in to what the, the coach has sold to the playing group, except for a select few players. I don't Whose think... fault is that, though, ultimately? Probably the board. 
<laughs> or is it nah, the coach? No, if there's yeah. a disconnect between players or coach, it could be it could be sh- like shitty culture, or it could be the coach's fault. I think I it's a shitty know. culture. It could be. I think the players are just like, as I said last week, they're just swag lords. They just think they're sick because they play for Carlton, but they're not real elite athletes, to be honest. I don't think they're, they're they're top level. I think there was I saw a chart of the amount of Carlton players that are actually in their prime though, and so there's so few of them. You know, so there's there so always many has kids been. Though. Yeah, and that's why they've always been shit. <laughs> <laughs> they need time to mature. And my position on Teague has been that uh, keep him unless you've got someone that you can't resist. Like someone like an Alistair Clarkson comes into the equation. But a Ross Lyon for me is while he's definitely a good coach. I don't know if it's worth turfing Teague right now yeah. when you've still got a year on Teague's contract. Maybe assess it for next year. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think he's going to get a sack from the sounds. But. Oh, some bird just took a flying shit. Jesus. That, that had weight that to had it. velocity. Eh? I felt the splash. <laughs> so, yeah, there was a seven-goal swing, and GWS just got on top of this game. Callum Ward has been playing absolutely out of his skin. Also playing well was Josh Kelly, Tim Taranto, just mm. the, the, the boys who you'd expect. Coming in, Haynes and Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, they pretty much just dominated the game from the back half, and they, they set up the play going forward just with high footy IQ. I'm a big fan of those three. Ed Kerno had four goals and 25 touches. He's uh, playing very well, as usual. He's a constant contributor. Eddie Betts, Caswell, kicked two goals in their final game. Eddie Betts with a, a very smart goal, which is what you'd expect to see from such a legend. Uh, but, yeah, just an ordinary season from the Blues. Harry Mackay wins the Coleman. Yay! Our club's still got underlying issues, but we won something. <laughs> Pretty crazy that he won the Coleman, considering he missed a lot of football mm. this year. Well, like, three or four games, at least. I do like Harry Mackay. How he, like, he's a very whack set shot kick, but it, he's, like, the best at him. Shout out to Harry Mackay. Well done. We're getting down to some real Clash of the Titans here, Jesse. We've got Essendon versus Collingwood. Collingwood finished second bottom on the ladder. That is bonkers. Lucky they have a high draft pick this year. Oh, oh wait! wait. <laughs> they don't. It's coming to GWS. They do have Nick Dacos, though. I had no doubts that Essendon were going to win this game. And even when Collingwood sort of made a bit of a bit of a fight out of it, I was like, no, Essendon are going to get up for this. No. They, they, they're going to pull away. Um, they led from start to finish. And they've been a very good side this season, Essendon. Won their last three, heading into the finals. And they've made that top eight spot, which we've been talking about for about a month or two now. Who's going to round out the top eight? Essendon. Essendon and GWS. Mm. So uh, good job to Essendon for uh, playing good football for all season long. Like, all worthy finals. Yes, I think so as well. Something that me and you recognised when we went and watched Essendon at Dreamtime was they weren't really clean going inside 50. Their mid to forward connection wasn't really there, but they have amended that. It does help that Peter Wright has bobbed up with uh, 11 goals in three games and in the second yeah. game he didn't kick a single goal. So, <laughs> no, it, it's great to see him sort of emerge as a key forward target for them. It's been an issue. And uh, I don't think people really expected him to be a gun when he came over from Gold Coast. Mm. It was a high draft pick. But uh, hadn't really excelled. And yeah, it's really interesting seeing um, what he can produce this final series. Coming into some good form. Waterman had four as well. Smith, string out, Redmond, all two goals each. So they do have some avenues to goal that they have opened up. Collingwood must be pretty stoked that the season is over, Jesse. It's been a stinker from start to finish. And now you can finally have a breath of fresh air. Ah, oh, we're going to get a new coach. And Scott Pendlebury's out of leave. Plenty of youth has developed this season, which is probably one of the few positives they can take out of it. Chris Main retired, which was sad to see. He was having a cry. A club legend at Frio. And he reinvented himself at Collingwood, despite uh, almost getting dropped at one point. Sad to see Maney finally hang up the boots. We've saved the best game for last, boys and girls. Adelaide versus North Melbourne. And I mean, this... Spoon Bowl. Spoon Bowl. Yes, North Melbourne won the Spoon Bowl. Mm. A genuine clash of the Titans here, Jesse. It was a massive game at Adelaide Oval. And I just thought, as a, as a supporter of a shit side, when you have the last home game of the season against another crap side... You should be winning that. Obviously, they had a couple of... Well, one retiree, David McKay, who I've never even realised is a player. <laughs> <laughs> That's bad, eh? You're not the first person to say well, that. Who's this right. guy? Yeah, Joyce isn't the same thing. He's like, I can't believe this guy's played 250 games. <laughs> and Tom Lynch, they're moving on as well. I don't yeah. really think that's a great call considering how much experience he could bring to a young side but whoever picks him up that'll be a, a good acquisition I believe I, and I honestly think Taylor Walker probably won't play for him again so mm. you'd think there's a fair bit of experience leaving Adelaide could be uh, could be another lean season for him not that that's necessarily the worst thing long term but mm. um, yeah next year might still be rough for him so David McKay my favourite Adelaide player kicked a goal in his last game which was good I've classic seen classic David McKay yeah, yeah that's yeah. classic that's a real David McKay he's guy. such a good like kick of the football <laughs> yeah he's really good and uh, Tom Lynch got one as well which is nice to see no surprise, Keane 
Uh, Keys was best on ground, sorry, with two goals and 38 touches. Laird had 40 touches. They've had very solid contributors all season long and on the North Melbourne side, off the ledger. Taron Thomas has been really good this season. He's really improved. He had another good game, took a big specky, which was nice to see. Kicked a couple of goals. Simpkin, Larky, LDU, Stevenson. Uh, there's probably others I'm forgetting as well, but they've really developed and matured this season. North Melbourne are on the up. The rebuild. Is going well. That's going to wrap up this episode of the Drew Footy Show. We are heading into the finals now, baby. So make sure you keep it locked to the Drew Footy channel, to the Drewsy channel. The season is about to get spicy. Jesse, next season, next week we will be talking about the finals games. So uh, if you want to see what we think about them, the previews, go check out Drew Footy for all of next rounds. Analysis. Yes. All right. Bye. Bye.